In the last 30 years or so, from roughly 1975 to the present, archaeologists have retrieved a large number of early Chinese texts from both tombs and from other sites. These texts are allowing scholars to completely revise the accepted narrative of the history of the Warring States period. Uh, and you can see the dates here, the Qin and the Han dynasty. Since a significant number of these texts are philosophical in nature, scholars have revisited the history of warring states thought. In addition, rediscovering that a long lost strain of thought identified as Huang Lao, the Yellow Emperor and Lao Tzu, that seems to have combined the ideas present in the text of the Lao Tzu with those found in the legalist tradition, such as the Han Feizhe. Scholars have been especially interested in reconsidering the nature of the self and the question of the nature of human nature, or xin, uh, in the light of these texts, most of which were previously unknown and had been lost for more than 2,000 years. The debate about human nature is best known through the different arguments found in the ideas expressed in the Confucian texts the Mencius and the Shunzi, which have been transmitted. The idea of the goodness of human nature, expounded in the Mencius, was taken as the foundation of the self from at least the Song dynasty to the early 20th century. Today, I will mention only briefly the names of some of the scholars who have addressed the issue of the philosophical self in these new texts that have thrown a great amount of light on the arguments among philosophers roughly at the same time as those found in the Mencius. Instead, I will focus on the far more numerous administrative documents and legal texts, which have been largely ignored by Western scholars. And I will examine the issue of the creation of the legal self and legal identity in early imperial China. One of the main reasons for doing this is because I believe that the creation of the individualized legal self by the competing and increasingly centralized bureaucratic states of the late warring states took place at the same time that philosophers began to reflect on the nature of the self and the individual. These philosophers focused on what I would call an internal view of the self. The self as seen from the individual's own perspective looking outwards, as well as its component parts. Whereas the bureaucratized states concentrated on creating an external self, and external identities. They wished to create individuals who could be manipulated and utilized to serve the state's own needs. Needless to say, the philosophers came up with radically different conclusions and focused on different aspects of the self and on identity, regardless of whether they were the followers of Confucius on the basis of which Roger Ames and his associates have developed the notion that the Confucian tradition emphasized a focused field uh, of selfhood. Taoists, drawn to prefer to deny or obliterate the conscious or fixed self, uh, as perhaps Professor Book Zipporin may have argued earlier in this lecture series. Whereas the texts of the Lao Tzu advocated for certain types of self-cultivation that link the self with the cosmos, as Michael Lafargue has shown in his book. And of course, then were also the Moists, the followers of Mu, uh, which is the subject of the first chapter in Erica Brindley's book, Individualism in Early China, Human Agency and the Self in uh, Thought and Politics, published in 19, uh, excuse me, in 20, uh, 2010. That's probably the most recent book on the self. And the Moists are well known for advocating universal love at the same time as uh, requiring that the uh, followers be completely subordinate to uh, the leader of their group. So it's kind of schizophrenic view of uh, the self. Virtually all of the scholars who have analyzed the philosophical texts have not really linked their studies to what was happening in the social and political world of the warring states, despite the fact that they are well aware that most of the philosophers argued their positions at the courts of the rulers of those states, 
and wanted their ideas to be implemented by them. Scholars have seen the text as speaking to each other rather than to specific problems or issues in contemporaneous society. Of course, this approach is understandable. It is inherently hard to make a clear connection between philosophical reflection and the society in which it takes place. And it is also the case that the scholarship on the philosophical text far exceeds the amount of scholarship on the social and political history of the period. Thus, knowledge of the latter is much less developed, unlike the situation, for example, in ancient Greece, where much more is known about the society in which Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle lived, and where studies of Greek philosophy <coughs> within its cultural context is much more advanced and sophisticated than it is in the early China field. Given that Chinese archaeologists have recovered literally hundreds of thousands of texts written mostly on slips and boards of bamboo and wood, and some on silk and other materials, much of, of which awaits proper publication, and which dates from roughly the 5th century BCE to the 4th century CE, a span of 700 years, it will take many generations of scholars to fully understand and integrate this new evidence into our understanding of the ancient Chinese past. Thus, while evidence is becoming available to place the debates of the philosophers within their social context, there is still an enormous amount of work to do. What I say today, therefore, will only scratch the surface of this new data and will only be a preliminary essay into the issues involved. A number of Western scholars of Chinese philosophy have analyzed the terms that the ancient philosophical text referred to uh, the various uh, aspects of the self. For example, Erica Brindley in her recent study uh, mentioned above, Individualism in Early China, uh, notes the following. And here, uh, can, say, can, you read, can you see this on the text, on the screen, or can I read, should I read it? Well, so we can see it. Can we see it? Yeah, yeah. OK. So basically, the, the philosophers have two terms, shen and ji. And uh, what she uh, points out is that there is a, ser a, a major difference between uh, the uh, Western view of uh, the self and early Chinese view. And uh, she emphasizes this, uh, the psychophysical psycho as aspects of the self, as well as certain aspects of personhood. And uh, she notes uh, these various terms at the end, uh, such as material force or ether, <coughs> qi, and the various constitution, constituents of a person, one's nature, xing, uh, one's xin, or heart, mind, qing, uh, emotion, spirit, uh, shen, spirituality, and the body, uh, shen and xing, are all part of the compl complicated mixture of self that emer emerges in early China. Among the texts that have been recently excavated, for example, from Chu Tomb No. 1 Guodian, dating from approximately 300 BCE, a number, perhaps belonging to the Confucian tradition, explore the various aspects of the concept of the psychophysical self. Of these texts, the text that has elicited the most significant amount of analysis in the present context is the so-called Sing Tzu Chu, uh, the, or nature uh, issues from, uh, uh, from decree issues. Uh, the other text that appears in, the, in this uh, group is uh, three early versions of the Lao Tzu, uh, <coughs> as, well as, <coughs> excuse me, as well as another text called Tai Yi Gives Birth to Water, uh, Tai Yi Sheng Shui. Um, this is, um, <coughs> as I said, this text dates from, these texts date from <coughs> roughly uh, 300, and uh, it's highly debated whether this is the Lao Tzu or whether these are versions of earlier texts which were then incorporated into the Lao Tzu. And this is uh, uh, exciting uh, Chinese scholars uh, greatly. The scenes of being true is important because it appears to be an intervention in the discussions in the Confucian tradition 
prior to the philosophical works of the Mencius about the nature of human nature and how emotions or genes relate to it. Ulrich uh, Mittendorf uh, states that the text reveals, quote, the important role the emotions play in motivation and affect regulation and is crucial to control uh, to the control of <coughs> social behavior. And what she uses is contemporary uh, sci psychological analysis of this text. It's a very long article. I'm not going to go into it further. <coughs> the burial, uh, late warring states and gin times were also deeply concerned about controlling social behavior. Uh, but they were much less interested in, in internal forms of self-control than the philosophers. Thus, the term for self specified, specified by Mittendorf, such as Shen and Ji, do not appear, or rarely appear, in the legal texts. Nor do individuals who are brought in for questioning in criminal cases appeal to their inner psychological states to justify their actions. One example is to be found in the looted hoard held by the Yeru Academy at Hunan University, where an individual states that he was angry that a couple committed illicit intercourse, sexual intercourse, in a government building, and therefore he reported them to the legal authorities. Generally, however, emotions are not recorded in the legal documents, and Qin officials were instructed not to decide cases on the basis of anger. In penal matters, the bureaucrats showed little interest in what motivated individuals to do wrong. What they were concerned about was determining what behavior was not acceptable and determining what punishments matched or done that behavior. This can be seen in the following example, where an individual commits a theft of relatively low value and is denounced by another person who intentionally raises the sum stolen in order to have the individual punished more severely. As the law punished thieves on the basis of the value of the sum or the goods uh, that were stolen, raising the level of uh, punishment uh, according to a fixed rate or schedule. In this case, the theft of 109 cash or less was punished less severely than the theft of cash of goods valued at 110 to 220 cash. And so you can see the text uh, on the screen. That the word match is used is interesting, as it later became one of the words in Chinese referring to obligation. And it can be translated in later non-legal texts as should or ought. The emotional motivation behind the denouncer for upping the amount that he claimed had been stolen, whether it was a matter of revenge for an insult, a long-standing argument, or whatever, is not of any concern to the legal authorities. However, as this example shows, it is not the case that the law was completely blind to inner psychology in all its forms. The law was concerned about different levels of intentionality and punished individuals, including officials, differently, depending on whether they acted carelessly, by mistake, by error, and by the margin of error, whether it was a small or a big mistake, calculated on its value in cash, and obviously big mistakes were punished more severely, or deliberately and on purpose, and so on. The largest amount of evidence about the creation of the legal self and legal identity comes from the state of the Qin that defeated its rivals and created the first Chinese empire in 221 BCE. The reason for this is that significant amounts of legal documents have been recovered by archaeologists from the tombs of Qin and early Han scribes. And additionally, much evidence has been recovered from well number one uh, Liye, Hunan province. So this is what the Liye tomb look, uh, well looked like. There were six wells, only one has been cleared. Uh, and this is what it looked like uh, originally in, in uh, Qin times. And there were uh, 18 levels of, of this uh, uh, well uh, and uh, 16 levels of documents. There are about uh, 38,000 of them in, uh, uh, in the well. And um, uh, it has proven 
to contain the remains of the archive of the Qing County of Qingling, which had been uh, discarded by the local authorities for some unknown reason after 209 BCE. Uh, that, the introduction to that uh, excavation is what I, asked, uh, uh, I circulated uh, before. Uh, essentially, at this point, only three levels of documents have been uh, published, so roughly uh, five, only 5,000 of these documents. So, as you can see, I'm slightly speculating. <laughs> uh, it is quite possible that other states in competition with Qin also developed similar techniques and policies to it. But the evidence is currently lacking uh, to say what their policies were and the nature of their legal systems. Once the Qin unified all the states into a unified empire, it prescribed that all matters of a legal nature and all else was to follow the Qin model and Qin practice. What were the principal aims of the Qin state? In brief, starting from the mid 4th century BCE, uh, with the reforms of Lord Shan or Shangyang, the leading Qin minister and general under Duke Xiao of Qin, uh, Qin sought to strengthen both its economy and its military power with, with the ultimate intention of destroying its rivals and unifying the East Asian subcontinent under its rule. Uh, and the works, the complete book of uh, Lord Chan has been recently published by Professor Yuri Pinez of uh, Hebrew University. How did the Qin proceed? It created a series of policies that were aimed to mobilize the population to support its long-term <coughs> goals. And the policies may be summed up under the following rubrics, and uh, you can see these on the screen. How did the Qin achieve its aims and operationalize these policies? Setting aside the technological uh, innovations it developed, first, it encouraged the immigration of poor commoners from other states to expand its population base and to develop its agricultural productivity. Immigrants were given tax breaks and access to land that they could cultivate. Second, and perhaps more importantly, it created a highly complex system of population registration, the details of which are only now becoming clear. The actual historical stages of this development, however, are still shrouded in mystery. Third, it created a system of meritocratic ranks for males that were awarded primarily on the basis of success on the battlefield. And by success on the battlefield, that means cutting off heads of the enemy. So you've got one degree of rank for one head, two degrees uh, for two ranks. These uh, ranks gave certain legal and economic privileges. But uh, today I'm not going to go into this uh, system because it was highly complicated and it's not as germane to the issue at hand. But before we turn to consider how the Qin managed its population through the means of its population registration system, we first have to consist, uh, uh, consider the history of naming in early China. <coughs> Nowadays, one way we generate a sense of ourselves is through our given name and our surname. That is, unless we are suffering from a mental illness in which we may identify multiple selves inhabiting our bodies. And all the human societies throughout history have identified their individuals by giving them names. In the Bronze Age Zhou Dynasty in China, starting roughly uh, uh, 1050, 1045 BCE, to the late spring and autumn and warring states periods, uh, it appears from the surviving evidence that it was the, only the aristocratic elite who had the privilege of bearing names. The aristocrats who dominated the various states were organized into lineages or tong. They were allied to the Zhou ruling house by marriage, being ritually subordinate to it, as well as being theoretically subordinate to it militarily and politically, although this changed radically after 770 BCE, 770 BCE, when the Zhou were driven from their original homeland in the northwest and were forced to relocate to modern Luoyang in the central plains. The entire system was known as the Dongfa system. 
What system of naming, if any, existed among the common people at the same time is not known. The Zongfa system was patriarchal and patrilineal. In each generation, the eldest son of the eldest son being the head of the lineage and controller of his ancestors' patrimony. Xin, the later term for surname, was something like a clan and uh, were only attached to the Zhou ruling house. Younger sons could establish their own lesser lineages called Shu. They were usually named after the territory where the first member was appointed to rule. Smaller lineages yet were called Zhu, although this latter term had appeared as early as in the Shang oracle bones from roughly 1250 BCE to the Zhou conquest referring to men who fought as a group, usually in hundreds, under the same banner. And this is what uh, the graph depicts. In fact, so uh, the left-hand side and the top right-hand side are, are a banner. Uh, and then uh, what is uh, uh, the image now of an arrow is actually a group of men. That's an identified graph. Um, the details of the Zongfa system have been the subject of numerous studies, and the questions surrounding it are far from being decided. Joe aristocrats, as a consequence, had, in the words of Endymion Wilkinson, in his uh, fourth edition of his uh, Chinese History of New Manual, as follows, and you can see this on uh, the screen. Beginning in the late spring and autumn period and continuing into the early warring states period and beyond, this aristocratic system of naming began to change, probably with the gradual demise of the aristocratic lineages themselves and the rise of a new group of men from humble beginnings uh, who later transformed into uh, the uh, scholar literati or shagath and they were especially associated um, with the, uh, as being disciples of Confucius. Gradually, surnames started to appear. The evidence for the process is scattered and incomplete, and it does not appear that there were state-sponsored rules regulating the creation of surnames. However, by late warring states times, the general population was being referred to by the sobriquet of the hundred surnames, the Baixi a term that previously had referred only to aristocrats, especially those linked to the Zhou royal line. In Qin, the only evidence in transmitted sources comes from the historical records by the grand historian of China, uh, Sima Tie, who wrote his magnum opus under the emperor Han Wudi, roughly at the turn of the second to first centuries BCE. Sima Tian mentions that King Zheng of Qin, later the first emperor, uh, ordered the population to self-report, or zhijang, uh, to the legal authorities as late as 231 BCE, just prior to the long campaigns that resulted in Qin's ultimate victory over all its rivals and the establishment of the empire in 221. In this system, which is recorded in later legal regulations, an individual was required to report his or her age and all his or her property with its value to the authorities so that they could determine his or her tax liabilities and the amount of labor and military service that was due to the state. At this time, clearly an individual would have had to have provide his name and probably both his given name and his surname. Misrepresenting the age, or underreporting or not reporting the property, resulted in fines and or other more serious penalties. The legal documents held by the Yellow Academy and published only last year provide other, another example of the system of self-reporting. In this case, uh, that for soldiers um, uh, in the Qin army, and here you can uh, see the uh, document on the screen, so I won't read this. The apparent reason for requiring soldiers to self-report was that the Qin kept very careful records of their behavior on the battlefield. Rules were established that punished cowardice in the face of the enemy, 
and soldiers were punished for a number of different offenses, such as running away from the enemy, where their punishment depended on the distance that the soldiers ran away. So, so 50, 50 paces or 100 paces, uh, for example, or absconding completely. If you did that, you were cut in two in the waist. Uh, to disobeying orders, selling one's government issued rations or one's equipment, and so on. It was also extremely important to record which soldier was responsible for cutting off of, the enemy, uh, of which enemy soldier, because, as I mentioned above, meritocratic rank was bestowed on soldiers on the basis of their success in cutting off enemy heads. They brought these into the army field headquarters, where the head was verified, and an elaborate system of reporting the rank bestowed passed on the information back to the soldier's home village. In fact, scribes kept records of who participated in an engagement and the behavior of the soldiers engaged in the fighting. There is one case in the Jang Jashan documents where the scribe himself ran away and disposed of the registers of the uh, combatants, throwing the entire legal <coughs> process of recording into total disarray. For the general population, the reporting seems to have been undertaken by the village chief or other ward or village official. The term is li, which is, means both ward in a town and village in the countryside. And if he failed in his duty, he would also be punished. This can be seen in an item taken from the Qin statutes on enrollment uh, that were covered from tomb number 11 Shui Hudi in 1975. And you can read this on the screen. This statute, which probably consists of two separate items, as I've marked, uh, requires a little explanation. In the first item, it, it is clear from the other evidence that the Qin determined uh, adulthood on the basis of an individual's height, six chi, five tsun, or six feet five inches, which, uh, since one chi was uh, 53.1 centimeters, is roughly 150.1 feet, one five centimeters, or 4.93 feet. And a mayor was believed to reach this height at approximately 17 sway, or 17 years of age. This is evidence that adults in the chin were quite small. If an individual did, did not ever reach that height, he was not considered to be an adult, and he was exempted from military service and probably had reduced or no labor service obligations. He was, in addition, considered to be less than a full legal individual with fewer legal rights. The term without thorough investigation was a legal term. Officials had to cross-check facts in a legal case and were liable for any errors in their reports. The legal retirement age was 65 if an individual lacked a degree of meritocratic rank or 60 if he did. So uh, you were required to provide military service in the army up until 65 if you did have, if you had no rank. Once an individual reached those ages, he was no longer liable uh, for military service and had reduced labor service obligations, but also from the age of 70 had other legal restrictions put upon him, uh, which I can talk about. Uh, a, a fine of one set of armor was calculated in cash. On the basis of evidence from a document in the looted Yeru Hoard, it can be calculated that the fine of one set of armor was the equivalent of 1344 cash, 1344 cash. And the fine of one shield was the equivalent of 384 cash. And in the early Han, one equivalent for the fine of redeemable shaving was 3780 cash. Given that it is also revealed that a day's labor for the state was calculated at eight cash per day, six cash uh, per day if one received food, these fines were quite heavy, as it would take many days of labor to work off the fines imposed if one did not have the cash on hand to pay them off all at one go. In the late warring states, Chin and early Han period, Individuals from the highest officials of the state down to ordinary commoners were given surnames. It is quite likely that slaves and other members of the lower orders were not given surnames, and if they were a member of the commoner population 
and were enslaved for some crime, it is quite possible that their surname was removed. Despite the fact that most of the free population had surnames, however, an individual was identified in administrative documents using only the official title or status plus the given name, not by his surname or her surname. In fact, until the recent discovery of the new legal and administrative material, there was little evidence for ordinary people's given names, and scholars did not evince any interest in finding out about them. They were only interested in the names of the elite. Now, with the discovery of Lieb, Lier, well number one, with its contents of the Chenling County Archive, and with the discovery of the earliest examples of household registers, found in the moat of the ancient town of Liye, uh, the ancient town of uh, Tianling, an abundance of commoners' names have been revealed, re revealed, both male and female. While it is clear that the Qin developed various sorts of registers, the most significant were the household registers, or Uji. The following, uh, as shown on the uh, slide, is an example of this sort of register excavated from the moat of the ancient city uh, or town of Tianling. And you can see this on the screen. While there are still a number of debates about the nature of these registers, several points are worth mentioning. First, the actual structure of the document. First, at the top of the right-hand side of the board, the name of the ward or the village is given, in this case, Nanyang. Next comes the identifier, uh, identifier Huren, which means that the name of the individual following is the head of the household. Then his rank is given. Then his surname and given name. Man was the name, general designation of southern barbarians. So this surname may have been given by the Qin authorities to indicate that he was originally of non-Qin uh, origin. Then his wife's name, given name, is listed. Her surname, her surname is not listed. Perhaps she never had one. But in these documents, uh, no surnames of wives are given, and there were a number of these that have been excavated. Then his children are listed, with the male before the female, and the fact that the children are non-adult is also recorded. Last, a household slave is listed. At the bottom, in larger calligraphy, it is noted that man is the head of a five-family group. In this register, it is also to be noted that no ages are listed, nor is the family's property. So this must be one sort of register, but not the type of register that was required to be made in King Jones' order that I mentioned above of 231 BCE. And just, uh, this is an example in the Lee uh, Museum uh, given to me by a uh, young colleague, Maxim Korolkov, uh, and this is what it looks like. As you can see, it's very, very long, uh, and the transcription is on the right-hand side. This is not the same one. Another type of register relating to the household registers is the following document uh, found in uh, well number one uh, uh, from uh, group, uh, from the, the level eight, which is the reason for the number. And so here you have, in this case, a baby girl uh, being registered by a chief, probably the chief of her ward or village, who then also registers a man who is probably her father. Uh, the original is on the right-hand side. Uh, it is possible that the graph for the chief's given name, uh, which is transcribed as Sir, might be a transcription error for Ong, uh, as the latter individual appears in another legal document as village chief. Uh, registering a transfer of property. However, it is notable that the gender of the child is not specified in this registered, uh, registration document, only her given name. So, given that this graph is written with the woman, or Nui, radical, it is reasonable, in my opinion, to assume that the Qin authorities could tell from the given name that the baby was a girl rather than a boy. Obviously, knowledge of the gender would be important to the state, as men and women had different legal obligations, and um, tax obligations, and of course, men uh, served in the army. This type of document suggests that a baby had to be registered with the authorities within a certain amount of, of time 
uh, after its birth. The household registers would then have to be updated. Yet another example is in the following, uh, where you have a registration of an official who is probably newly appointed to Chenling County, and you can see this on the screen. Here, the individual's height is given, as well as his age, and the color of his skin or his complexion. Notably, neither the color of the hair nor the color of the eyes is mentioned, presumably because all members of the population had black hair and the same dark color of eyes. So these features were not considered useful in identifying an individual. The name of the official responsible for the registration is also provided, as it is in the previous example, presumably because, in accordance with the statute I mentioned above, if afterwards some error in the record was detected, then the official would be held responsible and would be punished. Finally, there is this example uh, of a registration of a servant or a slave. When an individual is transferred into another's household as a servant or slave, this transaction had to also to be recorded with the authorities, because such individuals were considered the property of their owners and had a value. In addition, when a household decided to move from one location to another, this fact had to be recorded by the local officials, and the registration documents were moved uh, from one district uh, to another. When a legal case had been initiated against an individual, the state required that his or her identity had to be scrupulously verified. The clause that the state used in legal documents to solicit all this information is to be found in an order issued by the magistrate of Chenling County in the case of a missing student. And here you can see this. So in red is the mark. Uh, and here, uh, this comes, this has not been properly published yet, so I don't have an image of the original. Uh, and uh, the document obviously was split in two. Uh, one part comes from level 14 and one part from level 15. And so this is a sort of a search warrant for a missing student. Uh, hopefully no one's missing. <laughs> um, and uh, you will see by the end of it, in fact, the missing student is not to be found. Uh, so uh, the student got away. Uh, in the relevant clause, which is marked in red, it is the given name, Ming, the occupation, or Shu, and the ward village that are the primary markers of an individual's legal self and legal identity. In fact, the process of determining such information was specified as essential in the Shui Hu Di uh, forms, so-called models for sealing and physical examinations, which was a guidebook for local officials for processing legal cases. If an individual absconded for a certain period of time, abandoning his responsibilities to the authorities, then his name was removed from the registers and he was considered a non-person or less than a full human being. Thus, without these pieces of information, the individual did not exist for the authorities and was treated as a criminal. This can be seen in one of the statutes on abscondence held in the Yeru Academy, uh, which was published last year. So this is the first one. Uh, and read, so when a person absconds and must, one does not recognize the township, ward, or office, and there is no way to know what person he is, offices in the central counties or marches are to send the person to Xianyang, which is the capital of the Qin in the northwest, in commanderies, counties, and marches, uh, uh, in, sorry, in commanderies, counties and marches are to present the person to the metropolitan county of their commandery and in all cases detain him or her among the wall builders and grain pounders, uh, and those are hard labor convict, uh, and put them to work in the bureaus of granaries, shackle them, and order the rice pounders not to, uh, be, to leave or be released. And it's a little unclear what that means. Uh, and, and so on. It goes on, uh, uh, Xianyang as well as the metropolitan counties of the commanders are permanently to submit to higher authorities at the same time as the annual accounts, the numbers and cases of those whose township, ward, or village, or office are not recognizable, and they are to report them to the controller of the standards to which they are subordinate, uh, etc., etc., etc. 
Short of armed rebellion, absconding was one of the main ways in which the population could resist the imposition of the demands of the Qin state, and later the early Han state. And it is clear that numerous individuals availed themselves of this option, in spite of the risks of in involved of being caught and punished as criminals. Of course, there were also many examples of convicts absconding from their place of work. Jail was not the usual form of punishment. Most convicts were put to hard labor. There were also slaves leaving their, fleeing their masters, as well as soldiers fleeing from their assigned duties. As a consequence, both states issued statutes on abscondence, which specified in remarkable, even excessive detail, how such individuals were to be punished and how officials were to proceed with their prosecution. There are a number of examples of arrest warrants for absconders in the Lie archive, though they are mostly fragmentary, and that here are some examples of, of these, and I'll just show those on the screen. Uh, and this, one, this one here is quite interesting. This is a soldier. 25th year is just the year before the, the unification. And uh, he obviously is a soldier and he, he runs off. Uh, uh, he is a red, red color. I don't know exactly what they mean. Extremely hairy. But he's not grown a beard. Uh, and he's uh, well armed. So this is a, an armed and dangerous man. Uh, and uh, here are a few more uh, examples. And uh, also no noting in the case of 8891 that the, the person has no extra uh, scars to uh, be uh, uh, identified. Here we see that the authorities identify the individual by his home, ward, or village, his height, his complexion, general facial or other features, his last known clothing what he was carrying, and the location towards which it was thought that he was headed. Finally, let me say a few words about women's names. In late imperial China, often women's name, given names were concealed, and women, as well as men, were usually known by their relationships to other individuals, not by their given names, although there were some occasions when this practice was not observed. What was the situation in early imperial China? Endymion Wilkinson cites the late 5th century scholar Pei Jingren, you can see on the screen, who wrote in his Jinji the standard traditional view of women and their given names. Women have no given names, and therefore they have a lower status than that of their husbands. Country people have no names, and therefore they have a lower status than scholar gentry. You can probably tell that he is a member of the scholar Gendry. This is quoted in the early Song dynasty imperial encyclopedia, the Taiping Yulan. Wilkinson continues by stating that conventionally, different rules apply to the naming of men and women. And although girls received a given name in infancy, they were rarely referred to using it or uh, by, quote, any other name. They were refer, re, referred to by their family name and title. For example, Madame Chen or Chen Shen, meaning the lady of the Chen surname. And note here the difference in the meaning and usage of the word Shu between this and its meaning in earlier times. Or they were uh, referred to by that title. title. For example, Yang Weifei, the noble consort Yang, Tang Emperor Xuanzong's favorite in the mid 8th century. Thus, their identity was not really a personal identity, but a family identity or a social identity within the ranking system. Wilson, uh, Wilkinson further remarks, uh, women's names are therefore another example that the assumption that everyone had a family name and a personal name in China before the 20th century is misleading, because even if women had such names, they did not use them in society. The evidence from the recently excavated and retrieved texts shows that his observation is not entirely correct. In early imperial China, in the Qin and early Han dynasties, women were known by their given name 
is names in legal contexts. They could be heads of households, and they could own property in their own name, and they could present themselves in person to the court. This was completely forbidden in later times. In later times, a woman was not allowed to show herself in person and had to be represented by, either by her husband, father, son, brother, or other male relative. The statutes of the early Han dynasty, found in tomb, uh, 247 Zhang Jiaxia, also specifies that women held the same rank as their husbands. This is all new information as in, as, and is in stark contrast to the situation in later in Chinese history. I should also mention that legal cases from the early ha Eastern Han dynasty, late 1st and early 2nd centuries CE, that were discovered in the center of the modern city of Changsha in the well of a local government office, and which were published only last year, reveal that women were known by their surnames and given names at that time. So here's my brief conclusion. Bureaucrats in the centralizing states of the warring states China, especially in the state of Qin, were creating legal selves and legal identities for all members of the population, particularly by recording their names in household registers. Different types of statuses, such as merchants, were recorded on different registers. This allowed the tax state to extract taxes from the population, to exploit their labor, enabled it to conscript the males into their armies, and to control them in multiple ways. People were obliged to use this legal self and legal identity in all transactions with the state. For example, they were obliged to register with the state all transfers of property, including in wills, usually in person. They had to register their marriages. They had to have their registration documents transferred if they wished to re relocate from one place to another, even within the same county. They were not permitted to travel freely without passports. These passports provided their particulars. And when they were implicated in a legal matter, the state verified all information about them. It seems to have been a very personally invasive system, and many chose to reject the state's demands by absconding or running away <coughs> and removing their names from the registers. <coughs> by this act, they were condemned as being criminals and treated as non-persons by the state. Nevertheless, in this harsh system, women seem to have held a somewhat higher status in the early imperial period than was later the case in later Chinese empires. Much new light has been thrown on these issues with the discovery by archaeologists of these remarkable administrative documents and legal regulations. Yet much is still waiting to be published and we will learn much more about the system in the coming years. Thank you very much.